and we're going to start. So I want to start by welcoming all of you um, to this. This is a third in the Weaving the Webinar, Weaving the, um, the Web Links Between Women from uh, Greenham, uh, really right through, but this webinar is particularly focusing on women in black and other sort of connections to that, which we're hoping if we can get Sean on, will include Women's Aid to Former Yugoslavia. Um, so I just want to say just a little bit about um, uh, what, why uh, we're talking about um, weaving the webinar and to do that, uh, I'm going to share my screen with just a few uh, little um, uh, pictures, which I hope you can now see. I'm actually not going to risk trying to uh, show you the full pic, the full one, because um, so I hope you can see the central picture in the middle, because my um, my computer at the moment, when I'm going into full screen, it seems to just paralyze itself. So uh, we'll start with the walk from Women for Life on Earth that started on the 27th of uh, August, 1981 and arrived at Greenham on the 5th of September. And as we speak, there are Greenham daughters, if you like, some of whom literally were in push chairs as their mothers uh, took them or else they were taken as, as um, small girls to embrace the base and so on. And they are organizing as part of Greenham Women Everywhere. And if you go to the Greenham Women Everywhere website, you can get lots of information about this, a kind of recreation of that march, which is um, linking with today's issues. Uh, particularly the nuclear ban treaty, getting Britain and other countries that have nuclear weapons to join the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons that was negotiated in 2017 at the UN, has now entered into force. So connecting with the kind of nuclear arms race still going on among nine countries and the treaty that all the non-nuclear countries or a large number of them, including South Africa um, and in Europe, uh, Australia, Austria and Ireland and, you know, Philippines, um, Malaysia, a whole host of uh, Latin American countries and islands from the Pacific, um, including actually New Zealand, but not Australia yet. Um, not really an island is Australia and they are connected in as are NATO with all the nuclear arms, um, uh, nu so-called nuclear deterrence policies. So we have this walk going on as we speak that's going to get to Greenham on the 3rd of uh, September on Friday this week. And there's going to be a whole number of events going on, not only at Greenham over the weekend, but at the Aldermaston Women's Peace Camp, which was set up by three of us Greenham women in 1985. And so they're celebrating, Aldermaston Women's Peace Camp is celebrating their 36th anniversary. Um, at the same time. And so we're gonna be doing tours of Aldermaston and Burfield nuclear bomb factories and parties at Aldermaston and also at, at Greenham and lots of talks and, and events. So why do we call it? Oh, and this one I just wanna mention because there was a lovely film on BBC called Mothers, Missiles and the American President about a group of Welsh sisters, and you can find it on BBC iPlayer if you've got access to that, which I know the UK once had. And this was actually my first action, and it was the Welsh sisters that brought this action, this idea to Greenham when I'd only been there a couple of weeks, really wasn't intending to stay more than a couple of weeks. And, um, and so this became my first action of occupying the sentry box. But we are calling this weaving the webinars, because one of the things we did was we closed gates and we protected land by weaving the web at Greenham. It became very much something that we did to sort of confront the military. Um, and there's a lot of photographs about that. And we used it in this really iconic poster of the Greenham Women's Peace Camp, the international action on the third anniversary of the NATO decision 
to bring the cruise missiles and everything else into Greenham. Uh, so the cruise missiles into Greenham, the Pershing into, into Germany, the SS-20s, of course, were being brought in on the Soviet side. And we called it Embrace the Base. Oops, I've got it the wrong way around. Embrace the Base on Sunday, close the base on Monday. Um, so on Sunday, 35,000 women, 35,000 women for peace, embracing the base, so there'll be no more wars. That was Fallout Marching Band's song of, of that. And 6,000 <clears throat> women stayed overnight in December, freezing cold, really freezing cold. 6,000 stayed and blockaded all the way around the nine mile perimeter um, base. You can see here, the 30, some of the 35,000 women, and you can see the conditions. I mean, some of these areas were visible from the rows, but some of them were right up by the silos that were being built. And, um, and, uh, you, and really tough. And the 6,000, and I don't have a photo because I wanted to gun, run through this fairly quickly, but literally you, there are famous photos of the US Air Force uh, buses completely marooned in a sea of singing women, totally blocking every single possibly way, possible gate or way they could go in or out of Greenham. But they did bring the missiles in. And this shows a Greenham woman, cruise watch woman, a top, uh, her name was Sarah, a top of a cruise missile launcher when it came out of Greenham after being deployed in 1983. You can see these are massive. And Greenham women together with Cruise Watch, sometimes in women only actions, sometimes in the mixed actions with Cruise Watch, which were local people all the way, all the way along the, the route, were doing this kind of thing. Together we would slow down and then stop the missiles at middle of night. And then once we'd stopped them, women would climb on top and paint them and so on. And this is what Greenham looks like now. So this is why we talk about weaving, you know, weaving the webinars. And today we are talking about feminist peace, opposing violence, militarism, and war. And with speakers from Women in Black in Haifa, Belgrade, London, and Cape Town, and I will introduce them specifically, we will explore the personal and political connections in feminist peace activism. What are the different ways of Sorry, I'll stop sharing um, here. What are, what are the different ways um, of being visible and effective? How can we best centralize the needs and experiences of women and girls under occupation in wartime? And I think here about what's going on at the moment in Afghanistan, and, but also in, an, in a number of places still around the world. Um, how can we best centralize the needs and experiences of women and girls and take responsibility when living in aggressor nations? And some of, of our speakers are going to talk very specifically about that. And also how we perceive the links between patriarchal power, militarism, sexual violence, and rape as a war crime. And also, of course, how do we support each other as women and draw strength and keep on going for so many years of, of connecting and working against violence, um, militarism and war. So that's all from me. And now I'd like to turn to our uh, first uh, Women in Black speaker, which is Hannah Safran. And I asked all the speakers, well, how do you want to be described? And this is what Hannah said to me, a feminist, sorry, a lesbian peace and feminist activist with the Haifa Feminist Center and Women's Coalition for Peace, as well as opposing the occupation with women in black since 1988, and also through her research and teaching. Hannah, take it away. And while she's um, speaking, I'm just gonna share my screen with one um, picture for the, for Hannah, and then I'll turn back to, to Hannah um, with a stop share. Hannah, over to you. Thank you, Rebecca, and all our friends uh, on screen and off screen. 
It's really uh, an honor to be among you, and uh, especially since so many other women could do the job as, uh, as well as I can. So um, my turn now to say that um, it has been such a long road uh, to struggle and to persist on being uh, on the moral side of humanity. Um, if we win or if we lose at the end of the day, definitely in Palestine, Israel, uh, we didn't win. Uh, the situation here is much more severe and racist and difficult than it was in, way back in 1988. But we had to do what we thought was the right thing to do. And uh, and um, yes, we did it. Um, and we started uh, in uh, 1988, uh, just a few months after the Palestinian Intifada started. And it was a place where women could uh, meet other women and uh, uh, get strengthened by the idea that they are not on their own. Uh, in Haifa particularly, it was a place where Palestinian women and Jewish women could uh, stand outside together. Uh, there were not many places like this before, so it was very, very special. And um, many uh, women who were uh, lesbian or thinking that the company of women is something very important, it just, just um, it joined in, not necessarily because they uh, were uh, so much against the occupation or so much on the left, but that was the place where public demonstration of women was so uh, obvious and so strong. And a Palestinian friend of mine who was then 19, she said that was the first time when uh, each abuse against me, uh, when it was, a, 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 when I was abused, I felt that I'm not on my own because everybody here together are being abused. And, and she didn't understand why people are sending us to the kitchen. And what is the connection as much as we didn't understand why people are saying lesbian, go fuck with Arafat. What's the connection? So you end up not wanting to necessarily understand the connection, but make the connection. And the connection is that we are fighting against <coughs> patriarchy and patriarchy is war and patriarchy is militarism and, and patriarchy is the oppression of our own lives. So it was very important to be there in public to strengthen each other, to create other connection. And indeed, a um, few years later, the lesbian feminist community became much stronger than it was before. Many women were individual, uh, much more than our relative numbers in the community. And then um, uh, eventually uh, there were other uh, groups uh, in Israel of women doing different uh, aspects of uh, struggling against the occupation, like helping Palestinian women prisoners, uh, creating uh, dialogue groups, and so on and so forth. We really did the lot. Uh, and then the Second Intifada came, and, and the new groups came, like uh, Black Laundry, and they even marched naked. Uh, what more can you do? Um, you imagine something that we should have done, uh, we did it. Of course, it's a different, it's a different style and it's a different uh, size when Rebecca talks about 35,000 women, but you know, England is not Palestine, Israel. Uh, and we did manage to have lots of people outside in demonstration, not that it made any uh, bigger impact that, than when we are only 10 or 20, but we did what we really needed to do. And of course, we, we were influenced by other women and their, uh, what we knew about them, a black sash in South Africa, uh, the, the mother of uh, uh, Mayo in uh, Argentina, 
גרין אנד קומן, I cannot say how much women knew about green and common at that time. Uh, I definitely knew about that because I used to live in England. And the only reason why I didn't travel to green and common is because I was myself an immigrant and you are afraid to lose your status if you join uh, demonstrations. So you stay uh, private for... I stayed private for a few years. But then um, um, the impact is not necessarily one-to-one. It's a, it's a sort of a solidarity, an international solidarity that you feel. And uh, very soon after we started, we felt that other women around the world uh, using the same idea or in a different way. And we are part of, yes, a, a big uh, tapestry. Uh, weaving each one in a different country uh, what we need to weave. So um, there are so many things to say and so many uh, memories and even the current uh, struggles nowadays uh, which we tend to invite men to join in because nowadays you know you move from being a woman to a man in such an easy way so it doesn't really matter and so but uh, so one of the memories is this one where uh, I don't know if it's a good uh, depiction who, of who we were because most of us never wear a skirt or a dress but still this is what we used to create little things like that and wear them everywhere and it says here it says women in black in Arabic English and Hebrew and it says peace yes occupation no and that will do for now Thank you so very much, Hannah. Um, that's just, it's a really good introduction. And I realized at the beginning, I should have said a little bit more about how we're intending this to be a bit of a conversation. Um, and so I'd ask the speakers initially just to speak for a relatively short time, five or six minutes, and then we'll come back into more of a conversation. And we hope to be bringing some of, of, of the participants also into that uh, conversation. Um, so, so that's kind of how we're how we're seeing this. But that's a really wonderful start to just give us a picture of how Women in Black uh, started. And our next uh, speaker uh, is Lepa Mladenovic uh, from Women in Black Belgrade. And the description she gave me, and we wanted to put all of the much longer, I mean, they all, all of these women have really long and, and incredibly impressive biographies of, of their activism and all the, all of what they've, they, they've achieved and done, but uh, it was just difficult to, to, to organize all of that with the, the Green and Women Everywhere website in time. So I just asked everybody for two lines, and this was Lepers, lesbian, feminist, and anti-war activist with Women in Black Belgrade from 1991, insisting on solidarity and collective care in difficult times. So Lepa, over to you. <laughs> yes, uh, I want to, I'm really fascinated to be with all the legends of feminist peace uh, uh, and anti-war legend. I want to start with this photo because I was totally impressed. I had this photo uh, on a postcard uh, on my wall in the mid of 80s and watching it every day and imagined that I'm one of the women uh, uh, on the top and uh, that that's a circle of women only. And um, here that we were protesting our um, to reach our dream of feminist peace, but this is an image that itself feels like a dream. And so why is this uh, for me, uh, uh, image of feminist peace? Uh, one, because it's circle. Its circle is a symbol of equality, but also of Amazon women, Luna and Moon and so on. Second, because we hold hands and we want tenderness and togetherness to be values of the feminist future. Then here, third, is because we are disobedient. We are disobedient to patriarchy, we are disobedient to state, we are disobedient to society, to the family. And we are dancing on top of the nuclear silo 
on top of patriarchal throne, on top of the male world. I'm totally fascinated with this photo. And if if we don't dance, it's not our evolution. So that's uh, that's how this photo was really part of me. And then we go to um, 91 when the war started in uh, uh, in the country where I live. So uh, uh, we can go to the second photo. So uh, in the summer of 1991. Uh, a Serbian regime from the city I live in uh, started the war in Yugoslavia because uh, in order to control the other parts uh, uh, of republics who wanted to peacefully dissolve, but they, they didn't let them uh, go out peacefully, so they started uh, aggression to other parts. So uh, practically at the very beginning, uh, there was an anti-war movement and that's the summer of 91. So we are now at the 30 years of our uh, you know, history of anti-war movement. And then uh, very soon in October 91, we formed Women in Black Against War, practically uh, um, in solidarity with uh, uh, Women in Black from Israel. We took the model of, uh, of Women in Black in Israel, but also, uh, uh, at that time, uh, there was already uh, there were already groups of women in black in Italy and Spain because they took the model of Israel in order to um, to oppose their government's uh, involvement in the Gulf War in uh, in February '91. So we started uh, with our vigils for one hour, standing in black, and uh, and. Uh, so that's how we went on and me standing uh, on this, uh, this is Piazza, main Piazza in Belgrade for the next uh, uh, many years until the war was over in 1999. So uh, I want to say just uh, two, uh, uh, two things. What did, what did we learn and what did I learn? Uh, uh, two political points from this uh, anti-war movement. One, that women organizing to protest against war is in itself an aim. What do I mean? I mean, also like uh, Hannah said, we did not stop the war. The war was stopped in former Yugoslavia, but not because of the uh, anti-war movement or peace movement or not because of us, because of uh, other international interventions. So, uh, uh, but uh, of course, you know, we were making, we were creating feminist consciousness, we were creating politics and practice on every day with our activism workshops, writing public uh, statements like, you know, all of you have done and vigils, exhibitions, publishing, we have hundreds of copies, a thousand copies of books and all different activities. So, uh, uh, so my, my point is that our movement itself is a name, no matter where we reach. And then second point is uh, the picture three, which is a photo from the annual meeting Women's Solidarity Against War, that's the one. Uh, which we organized Women in Black Belgrade. And uh, also many women internationally came every year to this uh, meeting for 10 years, we organized uh, this solidarity meeting. So what was really uh, crucial for all these 10 years of the wartime was that we learned that circulation of women's solidarity is crucial for our mere, mere survival, just for our survival, for our political, for our moral, and for our emotional survival in the war zone and those of us who were around the war zone. So uh, I, can, uh, I can say, and I always keep repeating that women's solidarity saved my life. And uh, women used to come from different parts of the world to us activists to show us solidarity and we will see some of the actions uh, later on but at the same time we from Belgrade sent different kinds of solidarity to women in the war zones so this is exactly what I uh, really think that we need now in regarding to women in Afghanistan and many are already uh, doing it showing that women in Afghanistan are not alone that we care about them and we care in hundred many different ways. Also, by we we are we are caring also not only about women in Afghanistan, but that's really a critical moment now for women in Palestine, in Kurdistan, Sudan, Ethiopia, lesbians in Kakuma refugee camp, and so on. 
So uh, that is, I just also want to cite Marina Tsvetaeva. She is a grand poet from Russia who has written to a woman she loved very much in, who was in a war zone while she wasn't. And she said, I see you, I hear you, I feel you. Okay, so I just want to give for the end one example of the circulation of solidarity. So during uh, the, our anti-war activism uh, uh, and the uh, war in Bosnia and Her Herzegovina, uh, many feminists, as I said, and lesbians used to come to us and they used to ask us, what do you want? Shall, what shall we bring you? And well, I used to say chocolates because I love chocolates, but also at the same time, we were really asking them to, to bring us dry food and cans and items that we needed to put in the packages that we were sending to women in Sarajevo. And it was a siege town in Bosnia and Herzegovina. People could not get out and didn't have anything to eat in 1993, 94, 95. So, so practically, you know, we were circulating uh, a solidarity from them to us, from us to Sarajevo, and it was, uh, it was crucial because in this way, they are not alone, we are not alone, and we are seen by somebody. So that's uh, really uh, um, my main message today. That, uh, uh, and also uh, one question is here, what, what is feminist about all this? First, there is, uh, uh, again, a circle that we made here. And uh, uh, what is crucial for us, what we learned is that, you know, we are, insisting on sharing power. So that's what solidarity is. We are not abusing power. We are sharing because abuse power is from male violence in the family and in couples to the uh, to the national abuse of the power and governments who abuse the power. So we are sharing and we are insisting on tenderness instead of violence and war. Thank you. We can't hear. We can't hear you, Rebecca. I, I tried to go on to that. Um, this is one of those webinars where a lot of things are deciding to go wrong. Um, I, I love the, the way you put things in terms of the of the circles. And, and the connections. And I also, I want just to, to remind ourselves, we have um, a, a Afghani sisters, women like Latifa, who has got out of Afghanistan. Uh, and I think I saw Ariane's name, one of our women in black sisters from Canada, who I hope maybe can come in and talk a little bit later because she's been very um, involved in just trying to get some uh, a feminist human rights defenders to safety during this uh, appalling situation. But now um, I'm going to try to share my screen with, um, with this so that we can just, um, uh, if it hasn't decided to freeze, um, oh, it's decided to freeze, okay. Um, that may or may not work. So. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to bring up um, the, the photos that, um, that, um, oh dear, sorry, really sorry, this is just one of those days. I'm going to try to bring up the photos that Sean uh, gave me uh, for when um, when she speaks, but in the meantime, with apologies to Sean, both because you got kind of locked out for a while. Um, very, very glad you've managed to come in. I'd like to introduce Sean Jones, and this is how she wanted to be described. So Sean Jones, with other Green and Women, accidentally established Women's Aid to Former Yugoslavia, taking humanitarian aid and solidarity to anti-war, anti-nationalist groups, supporting refugee women in Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, and Kosovo during the 1990 wars. Over to you, Sean. 
I mean, that about says it all. So everything else I'll say will be sort of trimmings. Um, and I just want to, to sort of start off by saying why accidentally? Because we never meant to set up uh, an aid agency. Um, lots of us who had been at Greenham um, at the end of the 1980s, beginning of the 1990s, were carrying on actions not only at Greenham and at Aldermaston, which is another nuclear weapons establishment, uh, the British one with the American technology, um, and also something called Women on the Road for Peace, in which lots of women would bundle into some vehicles. Um, this is an aid vehicle as opposed to a women's aid for, for uh, um, as opposed to women on the road for peace vehicle and we would bundle into those vehicles and drive around Britain finding military bases where we could protest against our own country's uh, militarism, uh, nuclear weapons and anything else that we decided that we were going to protest against. And um, this second picture here is when we finally got to Belgrade. That's me and Ippy, one of the other women who helped found it. But we had this whole sort of idea that when the war broke out in, in before the war broke out in Yugoslavia, we went to an arms fair in Portsmouth at a place called Whale Island, um, where amongst other governments, uh, the government of what was then the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia was a participant. And that time it was one of the 10 biggest arms dealers in the world. So we were there, we were protesting against war crimes and somehow from Whale Island and various meetings at Greenham. And the sort of theme in our mind that war is menstrual envy, we had the idea that we wanted to do something to help. And the vague idea came to us. So we contacted the National Peace Council, who by that time were in email contact with, um, yeah, it was a, one of the, it wasn't exactly email, but there a great group of hackers from various different countries had gone to the different republics of Yugoslavia and had linked the peace groups through what we now know as the World Wide Web, but it was very much in its infancy. So via the National Peace Council, we wrote to all these women that we didn't know in Yugoslavia in various bits of it and said, um, what can we do? And we were generally women who had been used to lying down in front of things or climbing into things and we sort of thought that might be useful. And they said very firmly from Women in Black, Belgrade, the first to reply, bring us some aid. So we thought, oh, right. So that's how we began. It was a complete accident. We didn't have the idea that we would set up a humanitarian organization. And, and in fact, I don't think that we ever did um, because what we learned is that there, the aid industry is an absolutely horrendous industry, that the way in which refugees and displaced people are treated is absolutely horrendous. There are some very good people. And eventually, through Women in Black and through the Center for Women War Victims in Zagreb and through contact in Slovenia and through Medica Zenica and um, organizations in Tuzla in bon Bosnia and through Motrat Kirazi and Ego and other people in uh, Kosovo, we met in a way the women that we wanted to meet. And the whole aim of what we did was really to provide them with solidarity, um, to take things that showed respect for the women that they worked with. We never ever took anything that was secondhand, that was like a rule. Um, and we, although we started off with the support of various Greenham mailing lists and people we could find from Greenham, and that is what started us off. Eventually, um, we got to the stage where we launched a new knickers campaign because we really felt that women needed, you know, if you're in that situation being in a refugee camp, you'd like to have some clean underwear. So we launched a new knickers campaign and soon, sooner or later we were being supported by the readers of Cosmopolitan, not really on our political level. And we were also supported by the Women's Institute and Women's National Network. 
And somehow we managed to create an ideology that we were doing this with respect and with care. And, and in a way, I mean, that's what we learned from Greenham because we had learned how to, we had worked with each other through easy bits and through difficult bits. Um, and this was very much the same sort of voyage and the same sort of um, journey. And so when we, we met Women in Black, that little second picture that Rebecca showed was we went to our first Women in Black vigil. And so when we returned from that first um, trip to Slovenia, Croatia and uh, Serbia, we took back with us, first of all, the Women in Black and um, eventually linked up with Women in Black in London, but we went back to our homes or at Greenham, some women are living, others in Southampton, others in Bristol, um, others all over the place. We took that back. And also from women we met in Croatia and Serbia, we took back the uh, growing evidence and information for the way in which uh, war crimes of sexual violence, rape, and other forms of sexual abuse were being used as a, as a weapon of war. And it was with those ideas that we returned and transmitted those to um, people that we knew and to alternative media. I mean, it was a very do-it-yourself um, effort. We made it up as we went along. And in a way, I think... Ippy and I were talking about it the other night, and we hope that we have, between all of us who were involved, and there were hundreds of women involved in one way or another, we created an alternative way um, in which you can work in solidarity with women in war zones. And you can also, through direct action, then oppose what your own governments are doing, but that's a whole other Greenham story. Thank you very much, Sean. So, um, yes, I mean, I have to say it was an extraordinary experience. Um, I was a truck driver with one of your um, uh, convoys in 1993, and that's when I first went to Belgrade. I met Lepa and Stasha, Yadranka, Rada, Milka, and then I went back and slept in the corner of the WIB office for <laughs> some weeks. But that's how all of these things connect, and and the fact that that originated as a meeting at um, at at Greenham, um, you know. Also, you know, it was it was sort of that's I guess, you know, how the women's solidarity connections get made. Um, so my next um, speaker uh, or my next conversation list is Liz Khan, uh, and uh, for the um, yeah. So Liz Khan and I've kind of drawn this dis dis description. Um, a feminist peace activist went to Greenham for Embrace the Base, and then, like a lot of women who went for Embrace the Base, went home. Um, in her case, she had two daughters, you know, had other, other reasons for, for not being a, or, able to live uh, outside the base, but went home and founded a, a Greenham group. In her case, it was Hackney Greenham Group, and there was Camden Greenham Group, and there was Manchester Greenham Group, and Bradford Greenham Group. There were all sorts of Greenham Groups all up and down the country. Um, and so Liz Khan, a feminist peace activist with Hackney Greenham Group um, in the 1980s, also got involved um, with Women Against War Crime, which was part of that network that, you know, a number of us with Cynthia and others uh, sort of started just as the war began in Yugoslavia to really focus on the way in which rape was used as a, as a, um, a war crime. Um, and, um, to you know, trying to, uh, um, uh, raise awareness of this and get it recognized as a war crime. And that morphed into, and so Liz was one of the four co-founders of Women in Black in London, um, to which actually took the name, I think, in 1993, but had been a group that was organizing really from 1991 together to support and connect with Women in Black activists, especially 
um, in relation to uh, the occupation, the um, uh, women in black in, in, in Israel, Palestine, because that was of course still going on and bring in then the internationalism of, uh, of our anti-war support with Yugoslavia. So I'm going to ask Liz now to come in and just talk a little bit about your activism. And while you're doing that, I'm going to um, hope that I can put up uh, some, um, some pictures that are also shared from Cynthia, um, who sadly died in uh, 2019. But uh, Cynthia took a lot of these photographs that um, are there while Liz is speaking. Liz, over to you. Okay, well, thank you. Um, well, a lot of what I was going to say, I think you might have just said, Rebecca, but in the early 1980s, I was working in a feminist collective, which was working with children and with women. So providing almost alternative sort of ways of caring for children, challenging the stereo, uh, stereotypes, providing girls nights but working collectively we all shared all those those jobs and that was early 1980s and then in 1982 when the call for embracing the basic greenham took place we all went my work went in in our bus to greenham to join in with the other 29,900 and however many women um, and that was life-changing came back, it was, it was life-changing for me. Um, so came back and like Rebecca said, um, became part of a Hackney Greenham group. So we were the first Hackney Greenham group, Hackneys in London. By, by the time that we got rid of cruise missiles, um, I think it was, it was at 87, there were 16 groups just in Hackney, all <laughs> going up taking part in actions and that was the main actions that green and women were organizing but also we we took we we had actions of our own um and there'll be some photographs this the photograph you're looking at now oh the photograph you were looking at is us closing down the main road in hackney which we knew that if cruise missiles was going to come out and be used they were going to close all the main roads. And so we would do this 4 a.m. call and go and close the roads by five. And it was just to give an idea to the local people that this, was, this would happen. Um, the photograph you're looking at now was an action that our group, in fact, it wasn't just our group. There was more than just our Hackney group, but other Hackney groups. And this was at Aldermaston where some of us went in one of us had to type her own warrant um, sheet because they couldn't type. <laughs> the police couldn't type. Um, so, uh, so we stayed. We stayed as a as a support group, going down, taking actions, and it really it changed us because initially we didn't want to confront authority, the police, the army. And just over, over time, you know, sort of cutting fences, being arrested, um, being involved in actions, it, it changed us. And the, the fact that we got rid of cruise missiles and that even the Americans had left by 1992 really showed that if there was enough of you and you just kept on going, that it, it was a success. Um, so we were a group until about 1992 and then uh, Cynthia, who's taken a lot of the photos, and myself and other women involved in Greenham became Women Against War Crimes. Um, and we were protesting at that point outside the Yugoslav Embassy. We then, Cynthia was then involved in doing some research and was going to the former Yugoslavia, working with Medica. And we then learned about how the Italian women had taken the Women in Black vigil from Israel to Belgrade. And we then changed our name to Women in Black um, London. And we have protested ever since. We protest against militarism and war, 
justice for women, we look at the whole continuum of violence against women. So that's violence in the home and violence in war. And the photographs you're looking at now are us on demonstrations um, and the vigils. Um, I think that's probably all, oh, and this is a photograph of Cynthia. I think that's probably all I need to say, except for we protest once a month still around the Israel-Palestine issues. We always try and think about what women's particular issues are because they're so different than the general issues in war. So it's, and we're always asked um, for our government, you know, if it's about arms sales, it's looking at what could the money that we spend on arms sales actually do that would be different, you know, in terms of education, social care, health care, world care, aid. Um, and so we have continued our vigils weekly. This one is around the recent Afghan women and the dicey. We have a huge arms sales um, in London where we sell billions and billions of pounds. Um, so we go on week in, week out. We always meet on a Wednesday and that was in relation to, to connecting with the women in Belgrade. So women in black Belgrade, we still meet on a Wednesday. Sorry, thank you so much, Liz. That's, that's really great. And I, uh, it was lovely um, putting together uh, some of these um, pictures from, from Cynthia's various slideshows. So our next uh, speaker, and it's sort of, this was sort of a little bit chronological, although as you can see, again, the time zones also weave in and out and, and so on. But Vanessa, who is going to be our, our next speaker, a number of us first met really when we went to uh, the Women in Black conference in Cape Town, where um, Vanessa was uh, one of the Cape Town uh, organizers and taught us just a great deal um, in relation to that. And uh, she sent this lovely picture, which um, from that conference, and you'll have to tell us exactly where we were. I think we went to the, you tell us where we were, Vanessa. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Vanessa's description, uh, Vanessa, is it Rosaline? How did you pronounce it, Vanessa? Your middle name, because you've given our, your middle name and I love that I mean, name, Rosaline. Rosaline. Rosaline uh, is my grandmother's name. Beautiful. So Vanessa Rosaline Ludwig, and uh, uh, this is how she wanted to be described, African feminist who continues to work towards the dream she had as a, and she put in quotes, young revolutionary in the struggle in the 1980s for a free Africa and a peaceful, just world. And one of the connections uh, really was what in the 1980s, when we were at Greenham, both Greenham and CND made a lot of connections with the anti-apartheid movement and, you know, got arrested outside South Africa House in London and so on. And while we were doing this, Vanessa, who was uh, quite a bit younger, um, was um, an, in in an incredibly powerful young activist. Uh, and I'd like you to tell us a little bit about that and bring us then up to date um, with how with what things are looking like now, uh, Vanessa. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, after having listened to everybody, I'm I'm like, how do I even come in here? But um, when I when when Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp was starting in September 1981, I was a young 17 year old sitting in a very cold jail cell under Section Six of the Terrorism Act. So I knew absolutely nothing, obviously, about Greenham. <laughs> um, I only got to know about Greenham many, many, many years later. And I, believe me, I would have loved to have been part of that. I would have just made my year or probably a decade. And I, what, I, what I find fascinating about this um, is the fortitude of the women at Greenham. 
Because so I've been part of many campaigns, as we call them here. Uh, we do them outside Parliament. We, we've done them with the World Conference Against Racism in Durban. We've done them with the World Sustainable Development. And um, in other spaces as well in Africa. Um, but almost two decades. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I am still flabbergasted. The, I, I just, I salute you all. I'm, I'm, it's amazing what you've done. Um, and obviously also to bring uh, very much into the, the, the public domain, the issue of nuclear proliferation and what it can do. Um, in terms of women in black, in 2001, uh, there was a World Court of Women Against War for Peace was held in Cape Town. And as part of that, there was a women in black demonstration um, in Cape Town. I think we were like, what, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, I don't know how, how many, but uh, I think about 7,000 as part of this, all women in black vigils. Um, it was supposed to be silent, but there's no way you keep South African women silent at the demonstration. I mean, really. We were singing and dancing and shouting our slogans, and we closed off the the, what, the main the outside of the two main highways out of the city. We just closed it down. We were in the streets and we were performing. I remember Celine from Women in Black um, India coming to me and saying, "Can you please help talk to your people to calm them down? It's get back onto the pavements and be silent and just hold the posters." And I said to her, forget it, it's not going to happen. In fact, why don't you rather learn the songs and learn how to toy toy, you know, <laughs> because it's not going to happen. So that was my first engagement with Women in Black. Very powerful engagement. I loved it. Over the years, I, I participated in, in a few others around, around the globe. Um, most not to be through the, at the World Social Forum. But let's, let's fast forward here to 2007. When I took a group of young students to the World Social Forum in Nairobi, Kenya, we held in Nairobi, Kenya at the time. I mean, we'd been there already a couple of weeks because there were some feminist uh, um, uh, uh, conferences and workshops. And as part of, at one, 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 one of the events we attended one evening was a woman in black vigil in, at, at the main sports stadium in Nairobi. And some of the young students were so moved by what they experienced there. All these women silent with these posters giving their messages. And when they came back to South Africa, they said they wanted to form a South African chapter of Women in Black because they felt it was so powerful. And I said, South Africa, silence. And they said, that's exactly why we need to do this because we are never silent. Imagine how powerful it would be if we had a group of women in black with these posters standing and not saying anything for South African but women just don't know how to be signed. And so they started it. Um, I encouraged them and they started it and they had um, monthly demonstrations. They were very active in the pro-Palestinian rallies in South Africa. Every single pro-Palestinian rally, um, women in black South Africa, WIPSA, that's what called it, was there, represented there. Um, and it grew amongst, amongst students. And what was very good was that a lot of the young people that were involved, particularly, and, and because it was student-based, because I was working at the university at the time, not all of them were students, obviously, many working women, but the core, the core organizing group were students because they had more time. Um, there were some of them from other parts of Africa as well. So it wasn't just South African people. It was from Rwanda, from Kenya, from Uganda from Zimbabwe, all over, and they were part of this, and they, and they took it back to those areas once they left the university. So that was basically my involvement with Women in Black as a peace activist. Well, I think all feminists are peace activists. I, I wouldn't say I was a very peaceful youngster. Um, I used to always say to my grandma growing up, Ahma, you know, because we'd go out and demonstrate and we'd be beaten up and, and just terrible things would have shot everything. And I just say to her, you know, Ma, I don't think that ever we should say, oh, you must be more peaceful. You must be more peaceful because I used to be so angry. And I said, but there'll never be peace until the last one of them or the last one of us is dead. And she said, no, 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 no. You can't say that. 
because you can't beat evil by doing evil and violence is evil. And so I had to learn my grandmother's peaceful ways over the time, but also I think that all feminists, as, as one under, as understood feminism more, one understands that all feminists are peaceful because you are thinking all the different in a world where the vilest forms of violence have been perpetrated on, on women's bodies in the name of peace, democracy, you know, progress, prosperity, right? in the name of the pursuit of happiness and so-called social cohesion. This is what has been done to us. So you cannot be a feminist and not be a peace activist. Um, but yeah, so, so that's where we're at. Unfortunately, the last two years, we haven't done a lot of women in black activities. Uh, we want to do one at least every month. We normally go to taxi ranks where the most gross form of violence against women is perpetrated in South Africa, things like that um, along at train stations, all these spaces where women are constantly violent because it must be in a public space. But the past two years, COVID-19, we haven't really been able to do it. And we're hoping that should we all get vaccinated or at least um, obtain some form of herd immunity by the end of the year, we can start again with our activism at least by March next year. And I'll, I'll leave it there for now. We can continue the conversation again. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you uh, so much. Um, so that's all of the initial, you know, the speakers that we'd initially um, thought about uh, 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 starting off. And I'd like to ask this group now um, also whether you have questions uh, for each other or points that you want to make. I know that but by and large, we all know each other, but we're making some connections here. And um, I'm also Ah, okay. I was going to, uh, to bring Ariane in um, to, to speak, but she's declined the invitation to be a, a panelist. I was hoping um, um, maybe to, um, you know, to talk about... Um, oh, she, she accepts. Okay, good. So um, she's going to be, be brought in because I know that she's been doing a lot to do with Afghanistan. But before, while she just gets, sort of gathers her thoughts, because we've just asked her about that. Uh, Liz, do you ha ha have I do. I just wanted to, as everybody was talking, I just wanted to bring up Maple. And the reason I'm bringing up Maple is that my Hackney Greenham group, along with the Leicestershire group, Rutland, again, Cynthia was the link. We took, I don't know, a 20 or a 30 foot pole up onto, onto the RAF base in Rutland and did a maypole dance. Now that maypole um, became a maypole fund. And when Sean talks about Wafty and she talks about Plymouth, maypole helped to fund that. The same with all of the Women in Black conferences, we've helped to fund. So this little pool of money has changed women's lives around the world. And I just wanted to bring that in. That was us, ah, oh, there we go, look. So I just wanted to bring that in because we're still going 20, 30 years later, 35 years later. Oh, there I am, dancing the maple. Um, so yeah, we, we, one of the women inherited some money and it was put into a fund and it, we have constantly used that fund to cause chaos around the world. And I just really wanted to make sure that I brought that in. So thanks. Thank you for reminding us that. Yes, it, it's really empowered quite a bit of of our act activism is relatively small sums of money, but women can do so much with relatively small sums of money. And, you know, it's even going to be enabling us to have pr to print the songbooks and, you know, and contribute to there being a, um, a minibus and um, uh, to take, uh, for the Aldermaston Women's Peace Camp to be able to take women between Aldermaston and Greenham at this coming weekend, and also to make sure that we can run tours of the nuclear bomb factories and actually tell women who come down who've maybe never looked at or seen mm. Aldermaston and Burfield bomb factories, to actually show them, show them around so that, uh, that, that they, you know, because the UK is still increasing 
its its number of nuclear weapons, um, and and trying to ignore the fact that nuclear weapons are being banned by almost everybody else in the world. Uh, other kind of I, points. I wanted to uh, say something uh, uh, just to, to uh, maybe clear uh, something what Shan Jones said about humanitarian aid because uh, we feminists know that a humanitarian aid can be very political depends uh, what the context you know because uh, when 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 these communes that you draw you know lesbians driving communes who, who come to our door when we saw all all of you you know in our countries it was uh, really uh, nothing to do with the you know the image of humanitarian aid you know it was completely uh, something else and also what was really fascinating to us was that uh, when when all these communes that uh, Sean was saying came to our uh, uh, places you know they were all packed so nicely and carefully you know for our, our uh, specific women and they were all different you know like uh, you know different things in small packages and uh, uh, and also another thing is that we were fascinated with the fact that you know you uh, uh, you were uh, collecting uh, some of this aid by standing in front of the supermarket and standing giving uh, the people who enter uh, a leaflet that says you know you can buy this and this and 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 when you get out drop us in in this box and that will uh, go to uh, ex Yugoslavia war zone. So that was really fascinating because we were absolutely touched by the energy that that you brought this uh, uh, humanitarian. So it's really crucial. And I also want to say another example that at some point, some uh, feminists from Australia came to us and they said they brought some uh, uh, from their work, women's workshop, some, something they were cutting from a special material to be put on the windows. And they said, we want this that you give to the women in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Sarajevo, we brought it for them. They did not know that in Bosnia and Herzegovina, all the windows are broken because of the snipers and detonation. But anyway, I remember myself bringing these uh, these uh, these nice things for the windows for women in Sarajevo, and they were touched. No matter that they could not use it, but this energy of solidarity is incredible, and I really uh, am the one who is also now finding different ways how to send the solidarity to Afghanistan, so we can go on to Ariane. Thank, thank you so much, Lepa. And we have Ariane here. So I'd like to ask you, Ariane, can you update us a little bit? I know you're very involved in that uh, work uh, with Latifa and, and, and others. Can you unmute mute yourself now and just join our conversation to update what, what's going on um, with the women human rights defenders in Afghanistan? Ariane, can you unmute yourself? Uh, maybe. I just did. Ah. Thank you. Go ahead, go ahead, please. Talk to us. I don't always, I don't always hear you. So I, I don't know if you're saying, what are you saying to me at this point? Uh, I'm inviting you just to update us, really, to tell us. Um, I know that you're doing a lot of work to, to try to bring women, feminist, human rights defenders to safety in this appalling situation. Um, can you just let us know what's, what's happening, um, if, if you can? Yes. Do you hear me? Um, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, but you seem to be fr freezing a Since bit. Since I don't hear you, I will assume that. You... Yeah, I'm freezing a bit. I, uh, I don't, I don't quite understand yeah. what's going on. From moving to a, a quiet participant to a panelist, it, it changed. Uh, technically, something changed here. Oh. Um... But if you do hear me, I'm 
I'm, I'm trying to send you a message, Ariane, uh, uh, just to uh, speak about okay. With okay. Af your work with Afghani women. To go only uh, Okay, I think this unfortunately hasn't been been working. Um, I'm going to ask Jane, Jane who okay. is. If you're so, hearing me right now, I will, we are I hearing will try you right to, now. Uh, to, speak, speak to us. Can uh, you hear us? I put up the video because somebody asked me to do so. Um, um, That's probably Jane, our tech person, who's also a greener woman and a Watfi woman and goodness knows what, but can you hear us now? Can you hear me, Ariane? Okay, we'll, tr we'll try to see if we can get Ariane back. Um, I, I know Jane is, is, is gonna do her best um, to see if we can find a way to do that. And I'm gonna, in that case, call Vanessa in because I can see your hand up, Vanessa. I want to add that in, in, I forgot to add this, in 2017, 2018, we were uh, given the honor of hosting the 17th International Gathering of Women in Black in Cape Town. And we decided that the, the, the after some consultation that the theme should be displaced lives. And the reason for that was not just because of our own history, but if you look at what violence does, it displaces people. And we see right now what's obviously happening in Afghanistan. We've seen what happened in Syria. We've seen what happens everywhere. Violence and war displaces people. People are displaced because there's a reason. It's greed, it's money, it's power, it's political. It's all those things. And so for, so for, for me, when I'm thinking about how do we show solidarity? People are speaking about how do we show solidarity? It's really difficult. Um, when we you don't have the state power, but how do we show solidarity, particularly in the, in the to people who have been displaced because of violence and war? And I think that is the key, the key thing that we, we we need to start speaking about. And, and in South Africa, we have a very friendly refugee policy. We don't have camps. We don't believe in camps. People must be integrated. And yet, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that is much help for people. Right, and so, be, but because also people are within the communities, there's no visible space that you can say, "Oh, we've got to go and work there. We've got to bring some aid. We've got to do something." So, on one hand, yes, it's a more friendly policy. On another hand, it completely invisibilizes people because now they are all dispersed. And those are one of the, just one of the questions that I'm thinking. I'm thinking we are thinking through around those things because we're always going on about the camps and trying to get people out, but. Even our very liberal policy, for me, it actually invisibilizes people and makes them more vulnerable because now they're left to their own devices. The other thing I want to speak about to link to Green, you know, Rebecca, you spoke earlier about how they store weapons. The thing is that in Africa, if you look at what's been happening in Africa, and I, I, I watch the mining sector because I used to work for a, for the um, a, a black uh, and allied um, uh, mining construction workers union and the International Union of Mine Workers under Cyril Ramaphosa as a young organizer. And... Um, we still mine uranium. Our output has in fact increased. In Africa, if you look at what's happening in terms of mining in Africa, uranium is the new gold in Africa. And why would we be mining uranium? We're saying it's because of we want nuclear energy stations, power stations. But we know we have the technology, right? We are, and some and we just need the proper the, the right leaders and the right things and it will be nuclear weapons again. So I, I, I do think that we have to link it. We have to keep on, we have to keep on fighting this thing. So yeah, um, just to link it to Green and Com to say that the struggle is not over, um, but the struggle has moved to other terrains. Maybe it's not so much about, maybe we need to stop at a source. Maybe we need to start saying no new uranium mining. That's, that's, that's all I want to say. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for raising that issue. And that's exactly uh, one of the points that in the, 
one of the previous webinars held on Saturday where Pacific women were speaking uh, about their experiences of nuclear colonialism uh, and all the levels of pollution that come from bringing uranium out of the ground, the uranium mining that then leads into both the nuclear, the so-called nuclear energy, but it's all still, we, we rightly call it in a way nuclear power because it's a military industrial uh, economic power uh, source for those patriarchal uh, polluters going right right back to the beginnings of the of the of, you know atoms for peace was actually Eisenhower's way of sanitizing the fact that they were blowing all these nuclear weapons off after Hiroshima and Nagasaki where they were actually used they were then exploding these things in the Pacific and it was becoming very unpopular and the you know the radiation was spreading around the world and they decided to kind of sanitize it and make it well we can have this cheap safe clean energy we'll get the uranium out of the ground we'll turn it into nuclear fuel we'll we'll make energy and now it's being sold as if it's the answer to climate destruction and it is not you're absolutely right to raise that issue and there is a connection here and i know there are some aldermaston women's peace campers um on the on this webinar too uh, you know, the the issue of uranium mining and its connection to apartheid through the what was then called Rio Tinto Zinc, now RTZ, the Rossing mine, all of this, when Lorna Lynn and I, you know, went to Aldermaston to start that first weekend camp, and then we went back a month later, and then again, and we started to organize actions, the, the actions were very much connecting how the UK nuclear bombs have always relied on apartheid uh, 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 uranium or the, the or, or uranium dug by the Australian so-called British ally but on Aboriginal people's land, Indigenous people's land and so the struggle does absolutely have to come. The, the, the connection between nuclear energy and nuclear weapons has got to be understood. And it's also incredibly important that we, we do, you know, really resist this notion of sanitizing nuclear energy as if it solves the climate crisis. It does not, it is, is a polluting. It, it's also carbon intensive whenever they build a nuclear power plant. And, and, and the, the, the death and destruction and contamination of families who do the mining or where the mining is done, the communities, which is what you're talking about. Uh, it's just, thank you for bringing that into this conversation because it's really an important part of that. We're rapidly going towards having the, the last uh, quarter of an hour or so. So it, it, it does seem to have been a bit difficult for us to get Ariane, um, to be able to speak, but these webinars are going to continue at least to the end of the year. So I made a, I thought I was actually making a private request to her, but it would be great if we could bring some more of the webinars that we bring in weaving the webinars uh, out of Greenham into bringing, you know, women like Latifa, women like um, uh, Ariane, who's who's done so much on on uh, of solidarity work on these, and others. If you've got an idea for a weaving the webinar on an issue that's important to you, then then let us know, and we can find a way to make this happen, to host it, to get it up on the Green and Women Everywhere website, and so on. But for the last um, fifteen or so minutes, I'd just like to turn now back to the panelists, just you know, you've listened to each other, you're part of this, you, you know, your lives have woven in and out in all the ways that you do your, your working against violence, against women, against militarism, against war. So just reflect each couple of minutes each um, on, on any last thoughts that you want to share with us all. And I'm going to go, um, I'll actually start again. I'll go in the order that we came to because it's a long time since we heard from Hannah. Um, and so I'm just going to ask you, Hannah, to, to talk to us in your last few minutes. Um, there the are many things one, one could reflect uh, on. I think for us, as be, uh, for such an international meeting, 
it's uh, it's the strengths that we draw from each other, knowing that women uh, all over the world that are doing similar things. Sometimes um, with a knowledge of what other women are doing, and sometimes by the butterfly effect that you just do the same thing and you wake up in the morning and suddenly everybody is doing it everywhere because this is for us something so obvious war is little and and is killing and is something that should be stopped all over the world and uh, particularly now when we're talking about uh, the whole world is talking about a uh, Afghanistan and wow, the Americans left Afghanistan and how terrible it is. It is terrible the Ameri- that the Americans were there to begin with and the Russians were there before them, etc., etc. And what we have here in uh, Israel-Palestine is because the English were here uh, and they left a mess and they, thank you, and uh, etc., etc. It's all, all very, very connected to the history of colonialism in the last, I don't know, 400 years. And uh, I'm trying to understand that and undoing a colonial uh, legacy is, is so difficult and it takes so much energy and it's a... Uh, and, and energy is something that we get and give from each other. So it's, this, is, this is the strength we have. And as long as, uh, uh, what did you say, uh, Sean, the, it's our duty to find joy in our struggle, as long as you manage to enjoy what you do, and together with the suffering that you might feel or you might see, um, you keep going until one day, hopefully, even feminists uh, die. So that is not in our hands. So um, I don't know. It's just to say thank you and thank you for all those almost 60 people who joined us and remain incognito. And uh, But they're there and there are so many other uh, Women, and I must say men too, they, they are good allies sometimes and we should use them as our allies and, uh, and work together because uh, without uh, allies, we will not uh, be able to, to achieve anything. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. And I also wanted to say that um, we had uh, hoped to also have a Palestinian uh, women in black, uh, Rauda Morkos, uh, but she wasn't able to join us today. But I, because we can have these webinars going on at least to the end of the year, we're very much hoping to bring her and, um, and maybe some other women together to, to talk more directly and specifically about the, you know, the whole situation with the uh, Israeli occupation of, of, of Palestine. Um, but uh, that'll be later, and we, we do hope to bring that in. Now I'd like to turn to Lepa for your uh, closing kind of comments, remarks, questions you might have. Whatever. Closing, closing remark, joy is struggle. I, I will cite Vanessa, but I want to say two things on what Vanessa uh, uh, said. One is that I'm really fascinating to hear that there is a country in the world where the refugees are not in refugee camps. Because over here, and you have to understand that uh, Belgrade is on the famous Balkan route. And many thousands and thousands of refugees passed here. And those who are here, they are locked in the refugee camps. We can't see them, we cannot uh, support them, we cannot have any contact with them because we're not even allowed to get in. So, because the state really keeps them so that nobody even knows that they are there. So, and there is uh, about, mm, about 600 uh, Afghanistani people in, in, this, uh, in my neighborhood that I never saw. I mean, they, who are here already a couple of years. So that's one thing, but I also, because I'm the one work who was also working with women who survived the rape in war. And that's one of the issues that we, you mentioned at the beginning. I want to connect to what Vanessa said, that violence displaces people. But in fact, violence displaces emotionally the feeling of self. And so many women who have been raped in war are also 
outside of the war, they say they have to displace their feeling of, of who they are in order to survive. So many, many times they said we lost the feeling of home emotionally and, you know, uh, 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 as an experience, and that's what violence does. So this in this displacing, I just wanted to add another dimension on the uh, on on this uh, term of displacing. And uh, just to um, finish that, the solidarity is uh, the pearl of the feminist uh, 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 movement, and I'm so happy to be with all and everybody. Thank you very much, Lepa. <laughs> And Lepa also reminded us of, of refugees and uh, a number of us uh, joined a meeting last night uh, with refugees, lesbian refugees in uh, what's known as Block 13 of a huge refugee camp in Kenya known as Kakuma. And uh, there were a number of women there from uh, Women in Black and Million Women Rise and uh, some um, uh, and and Hina Hina has been um, working uh, very Hina from Greenham from Blue Gate back then. There's another connection there, and who happens to be my partner. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that um, but this is another connection that we we did make, and it often doesn't get talked about with in relation to Greenham, except in terms of the vilification that lesbians who were labeled in the, the tabloid newspapers as kind of burly dykes when we blockaded uh, the whole of Greenham, as opposed to the nice mothers and housewives and grandmothers when it was 35,000 women circling the base. And of course, it's all of, 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 of these, these kinds of women because that's, that's how it is. But I was struck by how many of the, of, uh, uh, of the women, uh, the speakers, um, uh, here also were identifying as lesbian feminists. And I want to let you know that Hina is indeed organizing a future webinar that will be for the Kakuma women, the Kakuma lesbians, and also the Lesbian Immigration Support Group, which is here in, Man in, in the UK in Manchester and does amazingly wonderful work to enable asylum seekers to, to get their to get out of the of of the you know asylum detention centers and get get settled settled and so on so that will be a future weaving the webinar that is made um you know late, later in the process now the next person i'm going to turn to is uh sean um i'm I'm just going to be very quick and I'm going to use my privilege because I think the things that a lot of us have done is about using our privilege. Um, is that the whole horrendous prospect, not only of what is happening to refugees from Syria and from Turkey and from Afghanistan who are being warehoused or in camps all over Europe, in Turkey and listening on the news today, the whole prospect of warehousing Afghans who think that they're going to get some form of um, refugee status or asylum, that is already being discussed. The Germans are discussing it because they think it's a vote loser. So we have that whole connect, what we need is to use the privilege that we have of women who are connected to keep raising this issue. It's extremely difficult. As, as Lepa said, you know, we didn't win the war and we're not going to win, but to actually inject some sort of humanity into the way that refugees are being considered. Because this, we are probably now at the sort of beginning of the floodgates of and it, it may well be flood, it may well be famine, it, it may well be snow, it may well be rain, it may well be any form of change in our planet, but the, the floodgates of climate refugees and no one is prepared for what that will do for people. And we heard, going back to Vanessa at the South Africa um, 
conference about how more people are moving south and other people are moving north. We're already seeing it in the number of people who are coming from North Africa towards Spain and towards Italy. We're also seeing the warehousing, which has already been done in Libya, where money is being paid by European governments to just pay to warehouse people in the most appalling conditions. So somehow, linking all of that together, we, we just are aware of there is this absolutely the enormity of what is coming. So if we can inject, inject any humanity into this process, and if we as women in black and women who have similar concerns can actually think about women, because it will have a direct impact on climate change, has a direct impact on women in displacement when they don't have water, I feel very despairing. I don't want to finish on a despairing note, but I think that that is what is coming to us next. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, and I realised that as you were speaking and I heard the dogs, I kind of inappropriately grinned because I know your 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 dogs that you have there. But uh, this is this is a horrendous situation that's going on. And if we are women in black and we are green and women, we need to really be thinking about how much more we need, we, we can do and, 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 and should be doing um, to help um, women uh, who are caught up in, in, these, in these military adventurism and wars, because we know as women, women, we never win wars. We are always, caught up in them, but we don't win them. Uh, and so the next uh, person I'd like to bring in, uh, our next, um, just for some, again, again uh, closing remarks is, is Liz. Um, okay. you want to say? Well, one of the things that I was thinking about is the full circle. And that is to say that last week I started, I, I joined the march that is marching to Greenham. Um, and what that's also doing was, there's a lot of old timers that were there initially, but there's also a lot of young people that have joined that march and are joining as the march progresses from Cardiff to Greenham. Um, and then we'll celebrate this coming weekend. Um, and then the other thing that gives me hope, because uh, I'm trying to think about hope really, is the numbers of young people and older people who are demonstrating and constantly um, bringing to the notice the, the climate issues. Um, and I think that the Women in Black vigil in London doesn't attract young people, but the climate change has, and I think that that is definitely their thing. So I feel that there is, there is hope, there will be, that solidarity that, that demonstrators will find and feel from one another in this struggle. Thank you, Liz. And thank you for bringing in XR. Uh, we're part, part of uh, XR Peace, which is the peace wing of XR. And in fact, last Wednesday, I was up at Piccadilly Circus talking about the connections between Greenham and XR and XR Peace, a number of us uh, from Greenham have been uh, activists uh, with XR since it was started and also uh, legal observers and helpers in various different kinds of ways. And it's really important to make those connections. And it was lovely that then when we set, set off away from Piccadilly Circus and, and uh, the police and the media were wanting to know where we were, well, we ended up at Oxford Circus and there were a whole circle. It was the Women's Action Day. That's why I was have been asked to speak. Uh, it was a whole circle of women um, of all sorts of different ages holding their hands around a very large pink table signifying we need to talk about this. We need to have people's assemblies to talk about the climate and how we tackle it in the ways that we want to change the world. And I, 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 and I went up and I asked to, to join this circle and the two women I was asking, you know, to reach out my hands to join, they just looked at me and smiled and they said, we're glued together. 
<laughs> so, so I sat myself down in front of them and uh, managed to stay there. It was the most stressful action I've had. Stay there for at least two and a half um, hours until the police came. And, um, and then because I had other things to do, I, I, I wasn't going to be arrested that day. But these connections are being made. And now I'd like to turn to Vanessa uh, to sort of really bring us up to date on in any way that you want on the kinds of discussions that you're having in Africa and the kinds of discussions that you're part of um, as Women in Black in Cape Town. Thanks, Rebecca. Oh, I, I think the key thing for us is definitely um, the issues around climate change, continuing wars and increased militarization, securitization in Africa. I think we, we, we kind of, with COVID, we, we, we've kind of pushed that to the back burner. But if you look at what's happening around us, every single region of Africa, there is war. And what are these wars about? They're about the extractive industry. And what's the industry, extractive industry about? The biggest ones are cobalt, uranium. Those are the biggest industries in gold. And what are those things necessary for? Nuclear weapons or nuclear industry. If you really look at it, I mean, if you look at, I mean, you're the, you're the expert, Rebecca, so you know exactly which things they need. So, so those are the key things. Um, subsequent divides, increasing poverty, increasing people are starving. Climate change is a big, big issue. Sectors, climate change, go ahead and militarization, uh, um, increased, I mean, like, like, like the increased, uh, we talk about the Amazon and the destruction of the Amazon, but forget about the Congo Basin and other parts of the world that also being destroyed and, and, the, and, and, the, and, and, the, and the imposition of in, um, industrialized commercial capitalist agriculture and moving people off the land, displacing people. And when they can't live in their own countries, they move to other countries and that creates even more conflict and war. So those are the issues we are talking about. But anyway, I wanted to end with something that I was part of my presentation in 2018 at Women in Black. I just want to read that because that's how I feel about this space. And I just want to say thank you very much for this space. So let, me, let me finish with that. It is in spaces like these that we can, honest, con we can contest fiercely, listen silently, learn intensely, and practice comradeship in a nonviolent way because the violence we are subjected to on a daily basis is so soul destroying. Most importantly, it's a space for engaging in the exact opposite of displacement, a space of coming together, of collating our ideas for our individual and collective survival, and ultimately our liberation. And to end up with that and say, that's what I found in Women in Black, that's what I find in spaces like these. So thank you for creating the space for me to be part of the collective and the collective solution thanks thanks very much bravo that was so beautiful and bravo, bravo bravo your words are how i feel every time i make these kinds of connections with women doing this this work of opposing violence militarism and war and building feminist peace i want to thank you vanessa i want to thank Sean and Liz and Hannah and Leper and also Jane, who is a Greenham woman. She's been behind her, her, her um, not showing her camera, but she's been our tech support valiantly in some difficulties that we've, we've had. I do apologize to anyone who couldn't get on this webinar to begin with um, due to a, a faulty link that kept telling you all that the meeting was already, I was in a different meeting or something. I want to apologize for all of that, but also to finish on a, a real high point too, because uh, we, we are still weaving the webs among women and among the issues that we work on. And uh, some of us are now going to go down to Greenham and Aldermaston for all the, the, the events that are happening at the weekend. But for those who are not, we will be holding more webinars and it's they're yours as my, I'm 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 here really saying please if you have an idea for a webinar on any of these issues that you connect with 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 Greenham whether it's you know refugees or you know wars in your area or the right to protest which is coming under threat in many of our countries 
you know, all of these sorts of issues. It doesn't have to be just about nuclear weapons. It's, it's really about all of these connected issues. Then um, let me know. Um, and um, and we, we will work with you to make it happen. Uh, for those of you that can't be uh, coming down to Greenham, I know that Zolde Ishtar is organizing what she calls a, a, a Women Round the Campfire. It was originally going to be just Australian and New Zealand women, but I think she's opening it and she's changing the time zone a little tiny bit. So, um, uh, you know, do contact us and we can, we can get, get you a link to that. But just to keep working together, to keep campaigning together, to keep loving each other and all of those that we work with to try to change the world, to build feminist peace. This is what we're trying to do and this is what we have to do because if we don't, then by either nuclear weapons or by climate, there is not going to be peace for anyone. Not for us, not for the, you know, the, the next generation, the daughters, the granddaughters. So it's our responsibility as those who've also been privileged within that military industrial complex that has caused so much damage through wars and climate destruction. It is, it is our job to try to hand the world over to the next generation in better shape than we um, have left it, are leaving it in. Thank you all so much, all of those listening in, all of those panelists, Thank you, in peace, and goodbye.